Hi, so um, hey, it's great to be here um, and uh, excited about uh, actually being here and talking in in the great state of Minnesota. Uh, it's interesting. Um, I, I Steve mentioned the global aspect, uh, and um, one of the things that I you know I there's a lot of hype about things like in the Internet of Things, but also just about technology and innovators in general. And one of the things that comes up a lot is, ah, if you want to be involved in an innovative environment, well, you've got to go to the coasts, right? So if you go to the New York Make Maker Fair, you'll find, you know, 100,000 people. If you go out to San, everyone's got to go to the Silicon Valley and see all this is going on. Um, and it's interesting to me, um, because I'm a Minnesota transplant, I'm not a native, so for those of you, um, and I came here kicking and screaming 14 years ago not having any idea, so I'll confess to you that. Uh, but what I learned about Minnesota is how much I like it here and how much there's so much energy about innovative thinking and changing and embracing changing paradigms. I'll give you an example of that. I don't know if you read um, a few weeks ago in the Star Tribune, they talked about the difference between Minnesota and Wisconsin. Because apparently, 60, some, 70 years ago, Minnesota and Wisconsin were very, very similar states. And we should be, right? We're geographically located in similar places. We have had pretty good educational institutions and all that. And since that time, Minnesota has actually flourished with everything from growth and innovation, new companies, <coughs> new startups, and uh, new innovation and all that. And in fact, I hope there aren't any big Wisconsin fans in here. I'm just talking about facts. And that Wisconsin is actually stagnated. And the question is, so why is that? I mean, the people, independent of how you might feel about the Packers or whatever, in general, a lot of times, people aren't all that different. Other than the fact that, like Wisconsin, you can buy liquor on Sundays and things like that. Really, we're not all that different. So what happens? Uh, and a lot comes through the way Minnesota treats education and has been open to innovators starting and all of that. So you had, uh, years ago, you had Cray Computer, Cray Research, you had Control Data, you had uh, a transformation which kept things going in Minnesota where Wisconsin didn't. So I think activity that you see actually on the coast happens right here in Minnesota. And I think because of our attitude as Minnesotans, I guess I'll call myself a Minnesotan now because I've been here for 14 years, we don't tend not to broadcast that as much. So it's really cool to have this conference so that we Minnesotans can talk about cool stuff going on in Minnesota. All right, so um, what I'd like to do is, uh, before we get started, uh-oh, there we go. Um, I'd like to understand a little bit about the audience here. So why? Um, so you can just raise your hands, and this is a self-declaration. So if you if you feel you're something else, then you maybe your day job is. That's cool, all right? So so who in the audience sees themselves as kind of an entrepreneur? All right, cool, a lot of them. All right, how about um, a maker, tinkerer, someone that just likes to get get their hands dirty and make cool stuff? Most everybody, awesome. Um, how about uh, those that are educators? All right, so we got a few educators uh, that, that stay here from spring break. That's good. So uh, welcome. That's that's really important. How about um, those that are investors? That's different than the entrepreneurs. Uh, okay, so a few investors. Nothing against investors. I like all investors, but. Sometimes they're not as willing to get their hands dirty as, as the entrepreneurs. That's why we make a distinction, so it's, uh, that's good. How about those that, uh, that just love embracing technology? I don't care what your career is. All right, most everybody. Awesome. Well, um, so I'm, gonna, I'm, a, I'm an old telecom guy. I, uh, I started, yeah, gosh, I'm a really old man now. Uh, I think I'm older than Steve, too, by the way, so... But I, I, so I started my career 28 years ago after graduate school with a little company called Bell Labs in New Jersey. And um, it's really interesting because uh, every time in my career, I always have thought, wow, this is the time to be in the technology field. This is the time 
because there's so much cool stuff going on. And back in 1987, that's what I thought. We were involved in uh, developing something called signaling system number seven that was going to transform telecom worldwide. Hey, by the way, those SS7 naysayers, it's still used today, by the way, to connect <laughs> almost all of your cellular calls. So, uh, uh, so that's kind of cool. So that's my little claim to fame. But anyway. Uh, but, the, and, um, but one of the things I've learned is that you always have to be looking out for new paradigms. And not just technologies, but the way business and technology is going to change. Give you an example in the uh, early 1990s, 1992-ish, I had a big meeting. I mean, now we were at AT&T, we were circuit switch people because we believed that people cared a lot about voice quality, quality of your phone call, and we had extra bass so that you have the very best voice quality on a phone call. And we believed that the only way to do that was something called circuit switch technology. So digital was cool, but it had to be a direct nailed up connection. Um, and, um, and some uh, researchers came, hey, you know, we've got this cool stuff. We think uh, IP technology is going to take over voice. And we said, what did we think we said in 1992? This was kind of like the beginning of the internet. We said, no way. There is no way consumers are going to be able to embrace voice over IP technology because the quality won't be there. There is no way you can guarantee quality of service. They're not going to have it. And, uh, and in fact, the voice quality that we had back in 1992, mm -hmm. I would argue, is still way better because it was full duplex and had all this and it, full range of frequencies, still way better than the voice quality we get today. So in one sense, we were right. Except we missed one big thing. What did we miss? No one talks on the freaking phone anymore, right? <laughs> it's not about that. I, I, was, uh, I was in my basement, uh, uh, I guess it was uh, two nights ago, and I found this box of old cell phones. And I know it gets kind of weird that I keep them all. But I had, uh, so I had my cell phone from 19, uh, actually from 20 years ago, from 1994, I guess, so a little bit more. It was a beautiful analog AT&T phone with state of the art, so it wasn't one of like one of those big, you know, big bricks. I mean, it was this was modular, but it was all analog, and it and it did no data, none. Uh, and I found my first Sprint phone, which actually did a whopping uh, first CDMA phone, 90, 9600 bits per second, and I thought that was rocking, right? And then I found my LG PH225 for those of you that had that flip phone back in 2005. And uh, it had something called 1X RTT data technology on it. And I thought that was awesome, right? Because what did that give me? That gave me actually up to 90 or 80 kilobits per second. Uh, and, uh, and so, of course, now uh, everyone probably has a smartphone, right? Does everyone have a, Is there anybody in here, just so we can single you out, does not have a smartphone? <laughs> Ah, hey, one, two, hey, we got a couple. Oh, oh, and we got some low hands in the back, right? So that's good. Um, I, it, it, it actually, part of the reason why that is because we, we it, our, our phones are no longer used for voice. Our phone are used uh, as an appendage, our auxiliary brain, or at least for me, it's my auxiliary brain. It's how I remember stuff because I'm an old guy and I can't remember anything anymore. So um, anyway, so paradigms are shifting. And uh, so we have to always be thinking about how technology might uh, apply in the future. And for an old guy like me, that's very, very hard. Because just when I think, uh, for, for example, that I, I'm staying current, I find, out that, um, I find out that, in fact, that I'm not. And fortunately, I have four sons. Steve neglected to mention that one of the areas that we met was uh, we met with our, our kids in Cub Scouts, uh, which is another, a good way of networking, meet, meeting other technology uh, people is through your children, by the way, in Cub Scouts and Scouting anyway. Um, fortunately, I uh, I uh, I have five, four sons that actually keep me try to keep me up to space. Um, as I give you an example, one of the things that uh, we make at Digi is uh, don't worry, I'll get to the meat of the presentation in a minute. Uh, is uh, we make this little radio called Nextbe. Uh, some some of you may know this little radio called Nextbe. It's about the size of a postage stamp comes in all shapes and sizes, and 
won't do any promo on products, but it's pretty popular, it turns out. And, um, and it turned out my son, was, uh, uh, who's an engineering student at Georgia Tech, because, you know, I work for the company that makes the XP, had kind of got his own little stash of XP's, right? So he had, an, he had them at school, and uh, one of his roommates uh, was needing a radio for a project, and he, he was trying to get his hands on an XP. And he found out my son had XP's. And so my son became an XP dealer. <laughs> now, back when I was in school, you weren't dealing in radios, right? I mean, you were dealing in... Uh, uh, I didn't, but I mean, I knew people that dealt in other things. Uh, and, uh, and here, and here, I'm thinking, wow. So I, I, there's a whole new distribution channel. I had no idea it could even exist. And the campus at Georgia Tech, I'm dealing in in ISM band radios, so that could be used for sensors and projects. So anyway, so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time. I'm going to talk about. Uh, the Internet of Things, um, and kind of why now, what's going on, what are the motivators, uh, why should we care, and also tell you what not to go chase, right? Um, and then I'm going to spend some time then after that on some technology trends. Uh, being a technology-oriented audience, I think a lot of you probably are familiar with a lot of these trends. But I want to talk to them in, the, in how I see them actually impacting the world that we live in and really seeing how it's going to change us. As I mentioned 10 years ago, what my phone was like, think of what your environment is going to be like 10 years from now. All the change that's happened in the last 10 years, 10 years from now, it's going to be double, right? It took me analog. It took me analog to 80 kilobits per second. It took me 10 years to get from 80 kilobits a second to 100 megabits per second. It took another 10 years. So, wow. So, what is the next 10 years going to take? And I think some of these technology trends actually have an impact on that. So, we'll spend some time there. And then I'll talk about, so, all right, how do you create an IoT solution? Or maybe as a lot of makers and entrepreneurs and all that, maybe you all have already figured this out. Um, but one of the keys to this is, in fact, us being able to share and collaborate and be open to new ideas and then think about the problem. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll spend some time on that. All right. So, kind of interesting. We... Uh, the way the technology works in here, by the way. So, uh, Steve and I were talking as we came in here. So, I'm using an iPad, right? So, I brought in here, this is one of the, the perils of technology transitions today. I brought in here a PC, an iPad, a phone, and I often sometimes bring an Apple TV in it that I didn't bring in. And the question is so, how, do you, how are we going to hook up, right? So, I ended up bringing up an iPad 2 attached to an HDMI cable because my PC only has a mini HDMI cable in. The classrooms at University of Minnesota in the engineering school don't support a mini HDMI connection. Can you believe that? So, um, but they support uh, you know, a VGA. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, that's okay. So, so the Internet of Things is everywhere. We talk about the Internet of Things. It's in the uh, in the media and all of that, and there's lots of discussion. Uh, a little while ago, one of the big things was actually the connected toothbrush, right? Now, um, the, the challenge with all this media hype and all of that is, some of these things on here, like the connected toothbrush, I will confess to you, and the connected toaster, I have no idea why you would want one. None. Sounds kind of cool, and I love the, the best, the latest gadget, just like anybody else. I have no idea why you'd want one. Um, the connected cow, actually, some of you may think, well, that's a stupid idea, too. Actually, the connected cow is actually a really valuable one, and, and really critical, uh, because um, I, I learned years ago visiting a dairy with, that had connected cows, that if you can monitor the temperature of your cows, you actually can know when they're getting sick and what their milk production is going to be and how much they're actually eating. So, and then you can automatically sort your cows. So there's, there's actually a business value to connected cows. Um, things like pill cans and all that. And then there's all this consumer hype. Um, how many wear one of these? 
Oh, so this is not a physically fit group, okay. Uh, well, um, and in fact, why do we have, why do I have this? Well, because I'm a gadget guy and I just like electric cars and everything. I'm, I'm an early adopter and I have to get my hands on just about every kind of piece of technology. But I realize I'm not the typical consumer um, I'm at all. Uh, there aren't very many people like me and so I'm a really lousy business model. But the challenge here is that there are lots of things, some of which are, out, from my perspective, are complete garbage. They're, yeah, all right. You can go to the walk uh, halls of Home Depot and you can find all these connected things. Um, and some are kind of cool from like GE Quirky and all that, but like the, um, you have things like the, uh, the uh, uh, monitoring your barbecue grill propane tank. Now, I, sounds kind of cool at first that you say, do I really need to do that from my smartphone? Well, no, right? So, um, but how do we make sense out of this? It turns out, and um, uh, Makina Research, uh, it's always good to have research people, they actually claim that they've calculated it all up and they said the Internet of Things right now in 2014 was a $474 billion marketplace. Did anyone, how many in here got a share, got their, felt they got their fair share of the $474 billion? <laughs> oh, there's a few, wow. There was a hand in the back, so that's good, so I'm glad we had, in fact, and, um, and they project it to be about $1.3 trillion uh, by 2019. Now, this is some data that we contrast with. Uh, a few years ago, there was a paper from Ericsson that said they, you know, they gave the multi-billion devices, the 50 billion devices, or right? It doesn't matter whether you want to talk about 70 billion connected things. And, um, I, and unfortunately for me, that's, there's a lot of hype, but it's, as a technologist and a businessman, business person, it's really hard for me to get my arms around, so what does that mean for me, and how can I get my fair share of, of that? Uh, it turns out of this $1.3 billion, do a trillion dollars, a good chunk of it is not in hardware, it's in applications and professional services, because the, the belief is that most of us want to actually be involved in the Internet of Things and don't know the first thing about how to do it. And so what do we do? We hire a bunch of consultants and try to figure that out. Um, and so in fact, we are gonna see that kind of spending. But um, I wanna offer you some caution. This is the cautionary tale. So for those of you trying to get excited about the, uh, the Internet of Things, Here's the, here, this is going to be your downer, uh, I, but I, I think we have to face reality. Uh, Gartner Group has this wonderful thing that they call their hype cycle. And let's make sure the animation finishes. Okay. And what they actually say is that there's an innovation trigger, all this stuff, and I'll talk about what that trigger is in a minute. And we are now at what they call the peak of inflated expectations. What does that mean? That means that there is all this buzz, there are wonderful conferences and people all talking and injecting lots of energy in, oh, we gotta hop on, gotta be part of the IoT, or the Internet of Things, and all that. But a lot of people are saying, well, wait a minute, but I'm not making any money out of this. So how, how is this all working? And so what happens is inevitably, we end up in what's called the trough of disillusionment. I always love these terms because, so effectively we say, oh crap, we gotta, maybe this isn't all that's gonna happen. Maybe uh, this really isn't, isn't all that it's cracked up to be. Uh, and then we end up in this slope of enlightenment, which, uh, and what happens here is that the new business models actually transpire and happen, and in fact, what we find our way out of it. We end up in this peak of inflated expectations because there's all this excitement about a concept, but we are locked into our old psyche, our old ways of uh, business models. And so we miss it. Uh, interesting example here. I was at the Mobile World Congress uh, a couple weeks ago in Barcelona, Spain. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Mobile World Congress. It's 100,000 people from around the world talking about cellular technology. Uh, and one of the big things was the uh, smartwatch. Now, 
How many of you planning on getting a, one of these smart watches? Oh, good, a few people. Ah, I, because I'm an early adopter, I always like all this kind of stuff, right? So I get it. But who from the mass media is actually going to buy a smart watch? <laughs> For the first time, I actually figured it out. And it was at, at the Mobile World Congress. Someone is actually breaking through. It might actually be Apple too, but they don't do these kinds of shows. And that was a smart watch that was really stylish, targeted at women. Not guys like me that like gadgets and like to, right, but targeted at women. Now why is that? Anyone have any idea? Okay, so I love my wife and I, I want to get in touch with her a lot because I, I like to communicate with her all the time. And one of my biggest frustrations is I call her on the phone and I, or I text her or whatever and I can't get in touch with her. Why is that? It's in her purse. Her phone is in her purse because she's very fashionable, which, uh, which is awesome. And, and fashionable clothes for women have no place to put your phone. You can't put your phone in my pocket like I like to have my phone in my pocket. And so I whip it out all the time and look at it and then push it right back in. So the perfect target market, it turns out, for the smart watch is not geeks like me. It's a stylish watch for women so that they can keep their phone in their purse and they can stay connected. Uh, that's a market that, who would have thought, right? It makes perfect sense, right? Yes. You're, gonna get, you're gonna get your smart watch? Yes. Yeah, see, you're on board now, right? It looks great. Yeah, well, that's the key. It's gotta look good, right? It can't be some big, clunky you know, piece of stuff like that I might be comfortable <laughs> having on my, my wrist because I'm a nerd and that's okay, right? Um, so this slope of enlightenment actually ends up new business, we kind of like start to figure it out. So we're right here. So the, the challenge for all of us in this audience is don't get caught up in this peak of inflated expectations. And fortunately, I'm going to give you some secrets later and tell you how you, how you get out of that, okay? So uh, well, I only got 25 minutes left, so maybe I won't get to the secret. <laughs> <laughs> but the goal is here, how do we turn hype into reality? And hype into reality by looking for the actual business model need that actually will make sense, as opposed to just getting stuck in our own payer paradigms. Don't be the telecom guy from the 1990s that said, people want voice quality, so voice over IP will never work. Because I've been that guy. And, you know, and now look at me. So, <laughs> all right, so what's going on? Why now? Well, so there's some things that have been going on that have caused us to get excited about this whole world. And, um, and some, I'll give you a customer example in a minute, but one of the, some of the things that's happened recently, cost of connectivity has gone way, way down. A cellular data plan five years ago cost would cost you for like a, just a, a thing, like a, ten, a simple 10 meg plan or something, it would cost you like 50 or $60 a month. I can get a cellular data plan for a little device, not like streaming video and stuff like that, not, I'm not talking about smartphones, uh, where I can, I can get a cellular data plan for 50 cents, right? So now the things I can connect just with a cellular radio are completely different. Cost of silicon is going down. Um, uh, so. Uh, Bluetooth low energy. Cost of a Bluetooth low energy radio from TI uh, 50, what is it, 5440? Uh, 50, no. Yeah. Um, will cost you about $2. All right? Which means that you can strap on a Bluetooth low energy interface to just about anything, whereas uh, 10 years ago, you were going to spend 20. Right? <laughs> Completely different. Cost of sensor is actually going down as well. Um, big data and storage. There's a lot of free stuff out there. I can get down to, I can get my stuff on, well, it's not, nothing's really free, right? Uh, we know that, but, uh, but the cost of that has plummeted and the cost of application integration because of wonderful frameworks, like you're gonna find out later this afternoon that are available, actually has gone down, which enables people to think about and involve in, in more new ways. And so what happens is uh, if you can connect more things and get more data, right, and as long as you're solving the appropriate problem, uh, things like efficiency can just go exponential. 
Uh, and that's what we are actually seeing in the business side of things happening now. Uh, unfortunately, um, there has to be a trigger, and I'll get to what that trigger is in just a second, but in order to maximize that, you have to avoid two, uh, well, there's multiple pitfalls, but here's two. Um, I, one of them is the whole notion of connect everything and innovation will just happen. Now, we're all innovative people. I, uh, I don't know what happens, everything happens at the Mobile World Congress, but four years ago, I was having a debate with a reporter, a uh, fine English reporter, about he believed that, well, the world was just going to come together, hold hands in kind of a kumbaya way, and just connect everything. If we just connected everything to the internet, then voila, innovation would just magically happen in the world. Now, what's wrong with that? It costs money to connect things, so you have to have a reason. So, it is, as benevolent as the people of the world are, people aren't just going to connect something just for the sake of connecting it. Um, the other one is, uh, and for those of you that work for companies, I don't know if you had this, some, have you had someone come to you, perhaps some executive or a boss, or, and says, we need an IoT strategy. I want you to create an IoT strategy. Tell us what an IoT strategy is. Anyone had that happen to them? Maybe someone's at this conference because uh, one of their bosses told them, we need an IoT strategy, go learn what this IoT stuff is all about. Oh, so nobody. Okay. Oh, oh there's... Sort of. Sort of. Well, okay, so um, if you are here for that reason, you need to go back and tell them that that was a really stupid question for them to ask you, okay? You should do it in a nice way because there's no such thing as an IoT strategy, right? Because IoT is not a market. It's a trend. It's a way of thinking about problems, but it's not, you don't end up with a, you don't end up with an IoT strategy. What you do is you end up with market needs to solve specific problems. So, here's the recipe. So, if you, want to, if you say you want to create some IoT thing, don't, don't start there. Start off with, um, am I dealing in the consumer space or the commercial space? Okay, simple. And if you are dealing in the consumer space, which my company does not do, by the way, we're, we're a commercial company, but we know this one. There are three primary motivators for consumer winning applications and winning solutions. They either are driven by convenience, so they make things easier for people. Entertainment, so they are amusing to people. And be careful about the entertainment, because entertainment wears off over time. Or they contribute to personal well-being. That could be personal health, personal safety. So, if you have an idea, ah, I think we should do this wonderful, cool whiz-bang app. If it doesn't meet one of those three things, and or at least one, you can get them all, it will lose in the consumer marketplace. Guaranteed. So just ask yourself that question, okay? Now on the commercial side, by the way, it's different. In the commercial, we're running businesses and we're trying to squeeze every last penny and so there are three primary motivators in the commercial space. What are they, if you're a manufacturer, what's the biggest challenge you have today? Your margins are declining because you're getting pressure from overseas manufacturers or all this, and you're trying to figure out how to add more value. Um, how do I get my customers to be addicted to me, right? So customer stickiness uh, is a big one. Or can I create something, can I have something that's going to generate new revenue streams for me, or finally drive business efficiency? So. Um, here, the motivator on the commercial side is all about how do I drive some kind of business improvement uh, that's going to effectively be the bottom line. Uh, if your thing doesn't do that, if your idea, you might have the coolest whiz-bang idea in the world, if it doesn't do that, um, then it's going to be a failure. So, for those of you that were sent here for an IoT strategy, go back to your boss and say, that was, I don't get the question, what is the problem that we want to try to solve? Um, ask that. And what is the pain point of our business? Then work back from there. And I'll, I'll walk through later on how to do that. But that's how I want you all to be thinking. So don't think about IoT as a marketplace. Don't think about IoT as some grand trend. It's all cool. Think about it as either solving a, a meeting a need of a consumer or meeting a commercial need. And then how do I fit into that puzzle? All right. 
That clear with everybody? Okay, so in order to do that though, we have to understand what kind of technology trends that we are dealing with. Because if we ignore technology trends, right, then again, guess what? We're gonna be that guy at Bell Labs that was trumpeting the voice over IP would never happen and we're gonna be stuck in circuit switch land forever. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about five, five trends which are impacting, I think, critical areas of how we see technology. Uh, first one is LTE. Now I know you all probably know about LTE because if you have smartphones and you're on the two-year cycle, uh, we know that 45% uh, of you actually, and in this room it's going to be much higher than that probably, but 45% of Americans have an LTE capable cell phone. Some of you probably thought it was much higher than that. Uh, for those of you that do, remember that in two years time, because the iPhone 4S just got turned off, right? Uh, discontinued. So in two years' time, that number is going to be about 70%. And in, in four years' time, it's going to be 100%. We know that because we know the way consumers work. Well, anyway, so two things are happening in the world of LTE. Um, and that is unbelievable amount of bandwidth, which means I don't need the local LAN, wireless LAN anymore. So how many of you have ever checked into a hotel room and got, got the Wi-Fi password and you were all thought you were cool because they had free Wi-Fi and you hit it and you get like 500 <coughs> kilobits per second. Anybody had that problem? <laughs> all right, so you know what? I never use hotel Wi-Fi anymore. Never. I only use my phone because my phone coverage with LTE pretty much in everywhere that I traveled in the US, uh, which is major cities mostly, so maybe on the countryside, uh, I actually get a really high bandwidth. I get, uh, I'll get at least uh, two megabit per second, and most of the time I get like 10, right? So I don't need Wi-Fi anymore. Um, the other thing that's happening is that um, on the sensor side, there is a new standard in the world. Um, I, they, they, they come up with these really goofy names. Cat zero, cat one, category, it, Anyway, the, the 3GPP needs a, a better way of marketing themselves. Even LTE is kind of a stupid term, but anyway. Because um, it stands for long-term evolution, implying that we're, you know, we're going to get there. But, all right, but anyway, point is that there's all this spectrum in LTE, right? And so one, it's spectral efficient. So it's the benefit of carriers to actually deploy operators, so AT&T and Verizon are duking this out, as much LTE as possible to turn off all your old crap because they can make more money. And we know that if there are opportunities to make more money, then generally that drives a direction. Well, uh, so why would you need for an IoT, a sensor application, why would you care about LTE? I mean, that's a common question I get. Well, it turns out there's this new standard on LTE which takes advantage of the, uh, the LTE modulation. So it's, a, it's an OFDM type modulation, which is very spectrally efficient, right? And, um, but, you can actually get very, very low power if you have an LTE-only cell phone or cell radio and you limit the bandwidth. So what happens is now I can offer, as the standard evolves in the next couple years, I can offer a small cellular radio that's as power efficient as a Zigbee radio. So what does that do or, or an 802.15.4 radio? Probably not as, not as power efficient as something like low energy Bluetooth, right, by the way. But that means that I don't need to have this extra level of complexity with all these little sensors going through a cellular gateway and all this other stuff. I can just put native cellular stuff on everything. Great for the operators. And they can do that because they don't have to worry about engineering. It's so that these little connections are actually much more, uh, much more powerful. So the world of LTE and which the U.S. is leading on, right? If I, I mentioned that 45% uh, in the U.S., uh, Europe's about 20%, by the way, and the rest of the world outside of China is, um, is about 5%, which makes us, in the end, in the U.S., give us, us over the next couple of years, a big competitive advantage. The one exception is China. China Mobile has rolled out 900,000 um, uh, actually, um, you know, points, uh, LTE points in, in the country. So uh, China Mobile is actually kicking all of our butts right now. But, uh, but 
Uh, but other than, other than China Mobile, uh, the U.S. is dominating this space, so it's kind of cool. All right, so embrace LTE is one thing. Embrace what's going to go on with LTE both on the device and sensor side, as well as uh, what's going on in the replacing the LAN environment. Okay, the next one is security. Uh, security is becoming more and more a big deal these days, so you have to embrace um, uh, the aspects of security. And one of the things that we know is that devices, things, whatever you want to call them, machines, are the laggards. If you go to the IET, IETF security standards and all that going, there's a lot of great security policies if you just follow it. Nobody should have a breach, really, if you just stay current, <laughs> except on the world of devices. Cloud Security Alliance still is behind on figuring out what to do with security on devices. Uh, the standard thing to do is to give your device a password. That's the most common thing today. It's not about encryption. Everyone does AES encryption. The encryption business isn't that hard. But how do you authenticate and how do you authorize and prevent somebody from uh, masquerading as somebody and hacking? Uh, and it turns out that uh, the number one thing in devices today is still passwords. And guess what? I don't know the last time you checked, but my thermostat is incapable of changing its own password. Um, and um, so that's a big problem. Home Wi-Fi networks, right? We all use these pre-shared keys. I've got, I, I, have, I have 90 things that are tied to my home Wi-Fi network. I'm sure that's probably fairly typical among the group in this room. And they all use the same pre-shared key. And imagine my dilemma of trying to change that pre-shared key. I, devices can't do it. You can't do change passwords. It's a big problem. Uh, we have a not so a place to innovate uh, is actually so looking at device side security, putting elliptical curve certificates in devices so that in fact you can actually have devices do a, appropriate authentication. Uh, Again, the encryption stuff is easy. We get too caught up in encryption. All right, third one, uh, RF technology. Uh, RF technology, um, I mentioned uh, low energy Bluetooth earlier. Uh, I was, I've historically been a big Bluetooth naysayer, by the way, I will confess, because um, for my business, Bluetooth was never a big deal. Uh, and, we, and we make plenty of money without ever doing Bluetooth, because I always thought of it as the way of coupling to a cell phone. Well. All right, so my, my bad there because it's a way of connecting to a coupling to a cell phone. And Bluetooth Low Energy, it turns out, um, well, uh, is actually the way of building that relationship with your cell phone. And it turns out you send out an uh, installer uh, to a site and they want to install a piece of equipment. Does the installer want to use their phone or do they want to use a laptop computer? They want to use their phone. Uh, so, um, uh, but the key thing with uh, RF, I mentioned the benefit of LTE. One of the things that we see in, in trends is there's still all these different standards. If you go to uh, get one of these Wink gateways at Best Buy or, what, or at uh, Home Depot, it's got five different radios in it. Uh, the world is still going to exist with all these different radio technologies. So uh, there's no getting away from it. There's not going to be any one big winner in the sensor level. Uh, still going to be a lot of Bluetooth low energy, still going to be a fair amount of Zigbee and all that just because of the installed base. So you're going to have to software, have software to find radios that actually embrace the different standards. And that's what we're seeing more and more and more of. Okay, <coughs> next one's cloud. How many, how many use the cloud today? All right, so everybody. Some people have, have kind of a curmudgeon look on their face like they use the cloud reluctantly. Um, <laughs> I, you know, it's funny because I would, uh, I would ask that question, this is an innovative group in a business group and we'd have no hands that would go up and it's really kind of funny. And then I ask them, well, how many have a Gmail account? And everyone goes, oh, I have a Gmail account. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I learned about the cloud computing and, and the cloud is, because we have a cloud platform. I like our cloud platform. It's a great data repository. We think we're leading edge. Uh, it's all Cassandra based for a data repository. We can collect lots and lots of data. We can do device management. Um, not going to try to sell you on our cloud at Digi, even though it's totally awesome, but I will expect that, um, that there is no one cloud. Uh, there is no master cloud. Clouds pop up daily, and so the value of 
don't try to like think of latch myself onto one cloud or whatever. Don't do that. Uh, you'll get stuck in a in this quagmire of you, well, a quagmire. You'll be stuck, right? Um, embrace the fact that there's going to be there will always be multiple clouds. And the key to your value proposition here, from what we see in technology going forward, is the ability of interacting with other clouds. So whether it's my jawbone or the fact that uh, that it, it, it talks to my run keeper, so convenience and personal well-being, or whether it's a business, uh, whether you're connecting digital device cloud for your sensor data to some other application cloud, um, you have to be able to incorporate all, embrace this. Do not be the, do not have the view of one cloud will serve them all because it will not happen. And finally, the last technology trend, and maybe um, the most important for me as I see innovation, is this whole notion of open platforms. Uh, I have the tagline Arduino Embed and Pi, oh my, uh, or Raspberry Pi. Uh, and uh, one of the things that's happened, why is software development today so much faster and so much more efficient today than it ever was? It ever has been. We are generating more lines of code and more applications faster and at lower cost than we ever have in the history of all humanity. You know, what's, what's going on with that? Well, one of the key things here is this open nature and the sharing of libraries and common environments. Linux has done a wonderful thing in, in the world of operating systems, right? Um, I mean, back when I was at AT&T, we were Unix. We thought Unix would rule the world. And there's only one problem with that, because we said it was the best. And in fact, it is, uh, as, the, as the evidence by Linux, which is really just a derivative, right? Well, why didn't Unix take off as much as, why did it take Linux? Because Linux opened it up and made it easy for people to say, oh, I need, I need a module to do this. Let me go find it. Well, the same thing happens at, at, in the microcontroller environment with things like Arduino. Why is Arduino so cool? It's just another little microcontroller development environment. There are like hundreds of those, right? Everyone's got one. Well, that's in fact, that's true. But Arduino is cool for anyone that's trying to make something because I guarantee if you want a module or an interface for a drone or for talking with a DigiXP or some other sensor or whatever, you can get online and you can find it. Now, the quality, you don't know, might be suspect, you don't might know, but gives you an enormous head start. Um, and so this whole notion of sharing and collaboration, uh, which actually kind of began with the incarnate, uh, in, incarnation of the internet, now what I see with these platforms, uh, it's taking off. And what's really cool is it's the students today that are, even dri are driving it even more. Um, I would go to meetings at, at Digi and we would be uh, talking about things like this and, uh, and people would say, oh no, we can't do that Arduino thing, that's for the makers. Well, it turns out that I go and talk to my son at Georgia Tech and what are his classes in? His classes as a computer engineering major in Georgia Tech are at Arduino and Embed. So guess what? He's going to go out in the industry and someone's going to say, build me one of these and what's he going to use? Arduino and Embed as an example. So. Uh, this movement is mainstream, so two years from now, more, all the commercial products that we go and buy are all going to be using these same platforms, just the same way that they use Linux. All right, so those are five technology areas, so you all got it. We understand what the motivators are. Uh-oh, I'm losing them. <laughs> they have a talk, so they're going to go set up. Oh, okay, all right. Well, I will let you go this time. Um, so. So how do we create an IoT solution? So we got all this technology we talked about, we talked about motivators. So what's the process that we go through? Do we start off with, okay, device network applications and all that? Well, yeah, we can. But um, the first thing to start off with is what problem are you trying to solve? What is the desired outcome? I'm a big believer in outcome-based thinking. So do not Say, I need a box that's got this, that's got these inputs and all that. Do not start there. Do not say, oh, I need a cloud application, or I need a way of collecting all the data off this jet engine. Do not start there. Uh, start with what is the desired outcome. i give you a very simple example. We did a, uh, an application a few years ago for a customer, and they were doing commercial air pumps. I love this example because it's so unbelievably simple. Commercial air pumps like it, at gas stations. So fill up your tires. 
All right, and uh, back then these were coin operated. Now they're all credit cards, so uh, some of the value is diminished. But coin operated, and they had two problems. They didn't know where these things were broken, so they were losing revenue. And the people that would go around and collect the money would keep a little for themselves. Uh, so they were losing revenue. So what they needed to do was they needed two pieces of data. That's it. So their problem was they wanted to stop the stop people from stealing their money, the collection guys. And they wanted to know when things were, systems were down, so that they could fix them and they would get no lost revenue. Very simple. So they needed two pieces of data. Is it working? And how many coins, how many quarters are in there? That's it. So they needed a cellular interface, so we built them a cellular box and let them collect the data, set it to our cloud and all that. But it had to be really cheap, right? It had to be, uh, you know, a dollar per month per machine or two dollars per month per machine, something like that. Um, but we got there because we started with what is the desired outcome. We didn't say, oh, I need a big control interface and a dashboard to monitor every one of these air pump machines and build some giant application. Next thing is, make sure you ask the question on that outcome, am I trying to get a vitamin or an aspirin? What do I mean by that? I mean, am I trying to make myself stronger? Am I trying to improve things, uh, improve productivity, improve revenue? grow, or am I trying to take away a pain? A pain that's resulting, if you, if you guys are, do the whole Kaizen thing, that eliminates waste, right? Um, and that relates to that desired outcome. Ask yourself that question. If you don't do that, you're going to miss out because you will end up trying to boil the ocean or solve world hunger or something that you, you, you can't possibly uh, solve. Next thing is, um, and I'll, I, I know some of you may be big data fans in here, and I like big data the, as well as anybody, but uh, sometimes we collect too much data. So it's not about big data, it's about collecting the right data. What data do I need? In my air pump example, I needed two pieces of data. I didn't need to know the, all of the diagnostics of the air compression. Now there might be some to do. But make sure you identify what data that you need. All right. Don't get too caught up. And then once you identify that data, use those technologies that we talked about and gather the raw materials together that you need. So you know what your problem is, you know what data you need. Once you know that, now I can know how do I get that pieces of data, what's the most cost effective way to do it? Do I need a Bluetooth low energy? Do I need a DigiXP? Which I'm sure you probably do. Uh, do I need a cellular product? Do I need a cloud application? Do I, what do I need? But, it, you, will, you will end up with over complexity, an overly complex solution, uh, and way too many materials if you don't start off in this process. All right, and then finally enter the cycle. Um, and you've probably seen different variants of this, so this is my version of this cycle. Prototype it. One of the beautiful things with all these tools like uh, Arduino and Embed and DigiXPs and all these other things out there is you have the ability of doing a prototype, proof of concept. How do you get something quickly? And that's the beauty of all these technology trends that are out there is I guarantee you can put together a prototype very, very quickly. And we actually even do, at Digi, we do hackathons encouraging all of our employees to say how fast can I put together a prototype to solve a specific problem. So prototype, evaluate, get customer feedback or user feedback, whoever is going to use it, right? Uh, and then figure out, then address, based on that feedback, how will I scale it, and then do another prototype, I do a, a more advanced prototype, and just iterate in this cycle until you've got it nailed. Um, if you do this, I mean, this is an agile like uh, methodology, right? I guarantee you'll end up with an optimal solution, and you will spend less money. Don't try to architect all everything all at once. Begin small, based on the problem you need and then innovate. So, and what I want you to do is today you're going to see lots of different talks that people have new tools and new ways of, of connecting things and all that. Take in all of those at education and collaboration that you're going to get today or any other conferences you go to. I'm sure IoT Fuse is probably the best place to, to get oh, that yeah. information. Yeah. Uh, but, and then follow this cycle and that's the way you're going to win and get out of this peak of expectations uh, and, and out of that trough of disillusionment and into something that's actually growing and adding value. All right? So.
Conclusion. Uh, Nate, no. This is a room of innovators. People are deploying things now. So if you're not tinkering and all that, you got to get on the bandwagon. It's a lot of fun, I guarantee it. Um, <laughs> leverage those drivers that I talked about. So avoid those pitfalls, that IoT strategy. Embrace the technology trends that I talked about, whether it's open, whether it's the evolution of LTE, the potential for the clouds, right? Um, and, and make sure you take into account security. Uh, and then focus on the outcomes. What problem am I gonna, do I need to solve? And then get out there and prototype. Everybody leaves here today, I expect you to have an idea for something you want, problem you wanna try to solve. I don't care whether it's your sprinkler system or, or uh, buying a smartwatch for your spouse, your wife, um, whatever it is, uh, but get out there and prototype something and make something happen and then start, uh, and start that process and that feedback loop, all right? That's how you're gonna win in this uh, IoT area where you know, this billion, trillion dollar market that's coming that uh, everyone's kind of, many people are kind of disillusioned and losing their way. So, and I guess most important is have fun. If you're not having fun, then uh, you shouldn't be here. So, um, I'm over time, Steve, so sorry about that, but thanks a lot. Thanks.